Okay. So, in the morning session, we examined our states of consciousness inside, inner states of consciousness, which is our relationship to the outward world. Now, we uh, will we can examine the outer world which we see through our consciousness and our instruments of perception. The outer world, what we call outer world, which in, in the waking state called Jagridavasta, we think is absolutely real. Let's take a look at that. And then see if there is a common point where they meet, the inner and the outer. Hmm? So, is that okay? If they meet at all, the outer world, as we see it. I think nobody has to tell you what the outer world is. You, I see you all sitting here, different uh, people in different designs, different shapes, different sizes, different voices. And then the outside world with the trees, which we think have life, but not like ours, because they don't have a brain or a spinal cord or anything of that kind. But they also are innately intelligent without the brain, because the brain is spread in their cells. Hmm. Because if you plant a tree where there is water close by, the roots will automatically follow and reach the water. Of course, they don't have a specific brain structure, but it's built in the intelligence. If you plant a tree where there is no sunlight, you'll see it grows this way, so that it gets enough sunlight. And if you become friendly with the tree, it becomes very friendly with you. Try it. Make sure nobody is watching when you talk to it. But uh, <laughs> be friendly with the tree. You'll see the comfort of sitting under a big tree. And you see all the people depicted from ancient times, Dakshina Murti in India, who sits under a banyan tree. Hmm? Um, Buddha sitting under the ficus religiosa people tree. Shirdi Sai Baba sitting under a neem tree of all things. All these trees have some link to us. The grass is linked to us. So every time you walk on the lawn, realize that they are also kicking on them in some way. Can't help it, but if they had a mouth, they would say, ah, we did not. So, this is the outside world. And of course the mountains, and the clouds, the rain, they seem to have their own life. We try to relate to them and sometimes we exploit them also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm talking about that, this world, which we see through our five senses and declare to be in the waking state to be absolutely real. Now, if you talk about consciousness and all that, people say, this is somewhere up there. But the reality is my cup of tea eh, here, or my cup of whiskey, or whatever, hmm. physical. So, we are going to look at that. And how do we register this world outside through our five senses? So. What are the five senses? And what do you say? Sense organs. Organs of perception. What are they? Panchendriyas. Eyes. Huh? Nose. Smell. Ear. Tongue. Touch. 
these are we don't have any other as the, at the moment we don't have any other instrument of perception right and it is these which give us the impression of the world that you live in in the waking state well in deep sleep and in uh, dream state these are all closed some some other organs and indriyas are working so now we are going to examine the absolute uh, certainty with which we look at an object and say that it exists we are going to look at logically no? not from the mystic point of view but understandable to you and me okay suppose for the purpose of study um we use a regular object uh like uh, let's say a cube you know it's a cube right six sides six sides one side is not visible usually because it rests on one side the rest is visible and it can be small cube or it can be a big cube and it can be of any color hmm? and it can be soft or hard it will have weight so when you see such an object you say yes i am absolutely sure this is a cube and it's colored red and it's this big 10 inches or four inches and so on hmm? and how do we know it through our sense organs now we are going to look at each of the attributes of this cube uh which we think are absolute and because of which we identify it as a cube wooden cube or metal cube depending on the quality and substance oh this is very interesting let's take what's the most obvious thing that we see first color most people um when you go to buy a car do you think which color to buy yes or generally yes um or when you see a wall you decide let me let me paint the wall this color because i like it and so so color so we are saying that this cube in fr- i wish i had a cube this cube in front of us is red is the first attribute of the cube that i see okay now if you look at it a little carefully you know that white light is made up of a spectrum which uh, in school we learnt as vibgior it means violet indigo blue green orange red the spectrum if you put send white light through a prism you'll see all these colors of which it is made of right so when all the colors are together it's white when no color is there it is black now this cube is red according to us the color red does it belong really to the cube or does it belong to the light yeah okay the cube because of the nature of its construction and its material it reflects only the red part of the spectrum and absorbs the rest so we say this is red well when you mix chemicals to make paint that's what we look at how to mix in such a way that it absorbs all colors and reflects only which we want right so 
what the cube actually does even though it's not doing it voluntarily is to reflect a certain color and absorb the rest so that red which we identify the cube with is not its own it's the color of light one attribute is gone down one wicket down okay leave it there let's look at other attributes you say still the cube is there yes the cube is there you say okay doesn't matter suppose it absorb all the colors of the spectrum you see it as a black cube if it reflected all the colors of the spectrum you see it as a white cube okay leave it there for the time being now you say it is big or small 6 by 6 is small for me not for the ant yeah if you measure with a scale a standard which we have fixed it is 6 or 4 inches but from the standard of measurement of an ant it's a hill which has to be laboriously climbed and come down on the other side yes or no you see how the ant labors to go over the cube when i put my finger like this hmm when you are small your others appear big <laughs> when you are big others appear small you will say that but they are the same but that is our standard of measurement which we have created but the actual size depends on the view the instrument of perception see that there is a great poet called alexander pope who said the difference is as great between the optic seeing as the object seen the difference depends also on the optics that sees apart from the object that is seen this is size one attribute you know it's i would say okay but what about this cube it's solid it's hard yes hard for me not for the elephant it's quite soft one kick and it's gone no effort for me it's hard color eliminated size eliminated you know for instance this cloth it appears solid to me i can't put my finger through but for the little virus or bacteria the warp and the oof the space between is like a fort it can go and come freely so is this solid or is it not solid relative i'm not saying it's wrong i'm only saying relatively so color is gone size is gone hardness is of the material is gone and then what remains shape we say all this is okay but it's a cube it's 4 by 4 by 4 it's a cube this is the shape it's not a round it's not a globe now this here we have to uh, tarry a bit and think carefully why do we see the shape of things as we see them because from birth we are equipped with a particular lens in the eyes we have a certain powered convex lens in our eyes which is why we see the shapes and the size that we see now what do you think of some other creature which is born with different kind of eyes how would it see the square would it really see it as a square or a flat or or a triangle how let's see it there are examples huh? yeah the common house fly has compound eyes and many eyes put together how will it see us 
when it has actually look you'll have to get into the fly's brain and eyes to look but just imagine how it would look it would see you like a flower with many petals that look like you or whatever and the center some dot i don't know how it will see but because it sees you that way with its compound eyes it would conclude that that is your shape we conclude that this is your shape because we are born with this kind of lens what if you are born with something else what will be the shape that you see so is the shape also relative or absolute it depends on the instrument of perception so if you eliminate then what remains it is yes yes it is not that it is not it is but how it is is very relative and the ancient said it is it is in the form of consciousness the images that we give to it depends on how we look at it isness is there what that isness is is defined by us it is of course i'm not saying it is not so perhaps when you are free of the conditioning of the mind you may look at the world as it is i s not of the different shapes that one thinks of and it is also understood that isness of a material object comes from the same so that the isness in me i am but for that many prejudices have to be removed from the mind we have to go deeper into the layers of the mind perhaps see through another set of instruments which we normally do not possess or are not activated yet imagine looking at one object from multiple points of view at once what would it be like uh, Unfortunately at the moment the only instruments of perception we have are the five senses. So also taste by which you uh identify something taste it's so different. You if you have jaundice you can give the best food but it will taste completely useless to you. It's not the food it's your tasting it right? if you look at all our sense perceptions it's the same it's very relative but something is there definitely our view of it may be different that isness is the essence of that object it is also the essence of our being and therefore the linked there is no so how do you know the link when these differences are removed for this I'm, i'm going to say at the moment we all know most people know that to live in this world and to accomplish all the things that we do you need only 20% of your brain what's happening to the rest of the brain are there centers which are other instruments of perception which are latent and which have not been activated the yogis say yes there are centers which can be activated plus the fact that now of late a great deal of study has been going on on the left brain and the right brain hmm we used to think it is all one chunk Yes it is but it has two parts and we have the left brain and the right brain and the coordination between the two is what makes a perfect and balanced life if one goes wonky then you are living in the left brain or right brain and both you know the left brain is our uh thinking brain 
which decides that I am, this M is sitting here, so his area is confined to this. If he steps in there, Mr. Ram might object, this is my area. Mm -hmm. This is here. I am defined. My shape, my size, my position, it's all defined by the left brain. It's also the brain that calculates. It says, be careful when you step down. There's a height there. You're going down. Then there is this creative brain which works mostly from the right side. The connecting uh, channels between these two in yoga are called Ida and Pingala. But we're working on this. Let's. So, the right brain, when it is fully functional, and if by any chance the left brain is shut down temporarily, then I don't feel that I'm confined only to this space. I'm here, I'm there, I'm everywhere. This is a fact. It's not my theory which I'm weaving out of it. There is There was a neuro called Jill Bolt. Some years ago, she also wrote a book called My Stroke of Insight. What happened to her was she um, had a stroke. Apparently, some people's a certain artery in the brain is built in such a way that it could rupture. So it ruptured and she had a stroke and the left side of the brain was filled with blood which means she became inactive. She just had enough time to call the ambulance. All she then remembers is a complete, almost lifeless mass on the armchair, but not unconscious. And the left brain, because of the draining of the blood there, became totally inactive. So all her practical calculations like I am Jill, I am sitting here and this is my space, vanished. When the right brain was only functioning. Please read that book, it's interesting. It's called My Stroke of Insight. <clears throat> she was not here, but she was here and there. And the bird which was singing from the tree was... She singing from the tree. I mean, it's difficult to say this, but this is how she felt that her space calculations had completely disappeared. And she was not only here, but also there. Now, this is also what Vedanta Spiri, all pervading. She was here and she was there, and the, the trees that moved in the wind were, she was moving with the wind. So in yoga, what are we trying to do in Kriya? Bring about a stroke so that you're left... No. <laughs> See, um, it's a, it simply means that there are functions of the brain which have not been actually fully discovered. Many activities going on in the brain. What has happened, I think, is that from the spine onwards, the, up, the lower brain, which is the cerebellum, and it's also called the reptilian brain, the ancient brain, which reacts to emergencies. It actually hisses when you see an emergency. It immediately puts you on alert, which is in the limbic system here. Now, when human beings started becoming more of the frontal lobe beings, while the bad Part of it could have been neglected, they neglected it completely. So we are now frontal lobe beings. We have no connection with that, that part of the brain, which is our original reptilian brain. Plus we tend to forget that the spine is only an extension of the brain. It is brain matter. When you say we are examining the brain, nobody examines the spine. We need to. So there are very many inactive centers in the brain which need to be activated. When these are activated, your entire view of the world undergoes a change. 
You're no more seeing only with your instruments of perception which you have, but an overall view from a different point. Then you see that you're not restricted to any one particular point, but are free. Not through a stroke, but through, um, I won't say manipulating, but through... Uh, Hmm? Hmm? Activation, stimulation. No, stimulation, activation, and bringing a balance between what we call the Ida and the Pingala. We, so, when this balance is attained, then you have one view which is from the instruments of perception, and another view which is beyond, which is a limitless, unconditioned view. I mean, limitless relatively, still has some limit, but relatively. So this is the world that we live in. And when you look, when you go deeper into your consciousness, you discover that this witness to all the three states that we discussed, whose content is pure consciousness or existence, is also, in one way, the essence of all the outside world that you live in. But, you cannot find it in the outside world, you can only activate it inside, and when it is activated, you see it also outside. And once the outside is seen to be the same as the inside, there is no need to close your eyes or meditate. Has anybody seen a picture of Ramana Maharshi with his eyes closed? Have you? Bring it to me if you like, if you have one. Because there was no need of going in or coming out. What is inside is also what is outside or the other way around. But it should start with first going in and then discovering from inside because you cannot go there and discover. So, this is what I wanted to discuss with you, since we discussed the inner world and the inner state of consciousness. I was wanting to check with you, about what about the outside world and the outside so-called consciousness plus? What we call solid matter is not solid matter. Also, nobody knows where the border ends and another starts. We think it's ended because that's all the capacity that we have, like sound. I ring the gong or I, I ring the bell and I can hear it up to a certain point. After that, I cannot hear it. Doesn't mean it's ended. No sound may, has ever ended. If you could hear everything, you'd go mad. It's always going on, but I don't hear it. Why? Because the frequency of my hearing instruments is only up to that limit. It cannot go beyond. For instance, there is something called a dog whistle. The dog hears it, you may not. The frequency to catch is not there in us. On the other hand, suppose we have in us another inner ear. It can probably hear much more than you hear with your outer ear. Uh, look at the mechanism of sight. Sight, which is so common. So common that you don't realize how important it is. Um, when I see something, first, the image of what you see is comes into your lens because the light is reflected on it. That's why in the darkness, when there is no light, you cannot see. There is light. The light falls on the object. It reflects back into your convex lens. And then it 
the retina registers the movement and that is then taken to the optic nerve which is actually at the back and then it, the whole picture is created and somebody is watching that picture and says okay this is a flower because I've seen previously flowers so it's a complex it's not so simple I, I think it's I see the flower okay good but you know what's happening the image is going in it's being recognized the nerve endings are activated then it is registered and then it's decided should I accept it or not is it good for me or not this is also working so there is somebody looking so for the eye suppose my eyes are open okay and I'm mm, sitting here and I'm seeing you but my mind is in the Himalayas, let's say. Image may fall, but it doesn't register. Haven't you seen sometimes you go to a boring lecture and you sit down and this guy is going on or whoever. But you're neither hearing what is being said nor seeing what's happening because your mind is somewhere else. Your mind is in, oh, don't know if the dog door is shut, has it gone away or things like that. Mm -hmm. So, more important than the instrument of perception, physical, is the mind. It has to be there. We are saying that behind the mind, there is another fellow who is watching the mind. <coughs> and that fellow cannot be caught physically. Mm. In Malayalam, in, in Kerala, there is a poem chanted by, basically by old people. Usually you will see people, old ladies chanting. <laughs> and it is a beautiful name, it's called Harinama Sankirtana. That means chanting of the name of, the, uh, of Hari, the Supreme Lord. Now every end of the Sloka ends with Hari Narayana Yanama. That's how it ends. But what precedes, what comes in front is deeply Vedantic and philosophical. One of them says, what I just now discussed, Kannina Kannu Manamagum Ganna Dina Kanna Hidunna Purul Tananna Riyumalavananda Mindu Hari Narayana Yanama. That means, Kannina kanna. Kanna means I. The I of the I is the mind. How blissful it is to know that I am also the I of the mind, which is the I of the I. Hari Narayana Yanama. <laughs> hmm? So it is that which we seek. The I of the I. The basic I, which sees everything, which understands everything, and for which all other instruments are working, like bonded labor. <laughs> and that, the good news is it's you and me and everybody else inside, in our deeper state, when everything is quiet and the mind is silent, there's only that I. It's not... The eye which says, oh, I am this, I am that, and so on. It's an indefinable eye, but it is there. Not a defined eye with its likes and dislikes, but an eye which in its true essence is in Vedanta called Satchidananda. It's called Satchidananda because that's our true essence. Because it is Sat. Satchid Ananda is three words. It is Sat. Sat meaning the truth. As opposed to that which is not true but we think is true. Sat, that is the Satsang. A group of people trying to figure out what the truth is. Which means we are, we kind of have concluded that what we think is the truth may not be the truth. Maybe, may not be. That inquiry is satsang. Right? So sat means the 
real truth, apart from what we think is the truth, this is Sat. That is the essence of our consciousness. And it is therefore Chit, because it is conscious. It's not an unconscious entity. It's a conscious entity. And its intrinsic nature is blissfulness, ananda. Uh, it doesn't depend on anything outside to be happy. It is self-contained and its attribute itself is ananda, is happiness. Bliss, let us say. We don't like the word happiness. This is Sachidananda. This is the essence of our being. Now, all the things that we do, basically, including Kriya or any other yogic practice, is meant to take us to that essence of our being, which when touched, it's over. Everything else, you know. As long as you don't touch it, you can keep breathing in and out, but there's no point. Any questions? Hmm? Maybe. I'm not sure, but in Ramana Maharshi's case, you should understand that he spent a lot of time contemplating and looking at himself, perhaps with his eyes closed. But after a certain stage, it was over. There was no division between the inner and the outer. So then... Out yes, but when ah, now there is, yeah, <laughs> no. Well, I think it's essential to go in before you discover that you don't need to go in or out. There is a beautiful Vedantic text called Ashtavakra Gita. Ashtavakra Samhita Gita. Um, Ashta Vakra means bent in eight places. Ashta Vakra. So you know the great uh, king Janaka was also a great sage. He was called King Sage, Rajarishi. And his guru, his teacher, was Yajnavalkya, the great teacher, uh, who appears in many Upanishads. Major part of Brihadharanyaka and so on. Now, Yajnavalkya is his teacher, Janakas. So, one day, this sage, this Rishi called Ashtavakra, nobody knows any other name for him, he was crippled. He was physically a cripple, bent in eight places. Must be terrible cripple. He comes to see Janaka. So, Janaka has heard about his being a great Rishi, so he welcomes him. The tradition is when a guest appears, wash his feet, because he's coming in from the dust. And uh, also as a mark of respect and give him water to drink and make him sit down. Which is why Yamadeva was upset that he couldn't look after Nachiketas. So, he seats him. Ashtavakra starts a dialogue with Janaka. He says, So, O king, do you think now you are free? You have attained the mukti or moksha. Janaka said, Yes, I think so. So, what happens? He says, Yajnavalke has taught me how to attain samadhi. So, in samadhi, my individual identity disappears. There's only the universal. And then when I... So he said, now? Now I have come back from Samadhi. So I am there and you are there and everything else is there. He says, if that is there, that you need to go in and come out, you have not attained freedom. Freedom is when there is no going in or coming out. Because then your happiness, your freedom depends on going into Samadhi. Now you are saying, I am not free. 
because I am not in Samadhi. So that means your freedom is dependent on a state called Samadhi. If you are always free, I would accept that you have attained Moksha, Nirvana. And then continues to teach. It's called Rashtavakari. I can't go into it now. You can go. It's very, it's not so complicated, but it sounds funny when you read first time. Mm. Sir, uh, can you please explain one more time? Uh, right? Yes. Huh. Sir, you, you said that what we see externally may be related to how we see it, how we see it. So in the most simplistic language, how should we deal with this or do we need to do it? You cannot, you cannot deal with it because it is so. You can understand it is so. You can you deal with it? Like, because you are born with certain sets of instruments of perception, right? You cannot change these. Perhaps when you reach a stage where you can see without these, then you get a different alternate view of the world. As long as your sight and your feeling and your life is dependent on these instruments of perception, you can do nothing about it. But at least you can say this may not be the truth. Let me give it benefit of doubt. This much you can do. Beyond that, unless you come to a point where you can see without these, well, that sight is interesting. It is as if all the senses are working together at the same time. See, normally once, this is, once, <laughs> I, if I go more, they think I'm gone crazy. We, usually one sense or two senses work for us, maximum, depending upon what is mostly active. All the senses do not work together at the same time. There is, we know that there is, I know that there is a, a state or a stage where everything works together at the same time. When you look at something, shape, the size, the smell, the, this whole thing is together, working together. And then you see the different dimension of the object which you thought was this, which you had defined already. What I'm trying to say is that we live by our own definitions, which are formed by our conditioned reflexes, and experiences. While the absolute truth of that world that we live in may be completely different. Maybe. That's all I'm saying. I need to work on this to figure out. In the book about uh, your Guruji where you tried to photograph and somehow the photos never emerged, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, know, I, you know, I wish I could do that. Anyway. Um, Imagine somebody is so happy to have a photograph. Hmm? They come with a camera and then they go home, there's nothing to... It's horrible. So anyway, uh -huh. so his explanation was, he's talking about a particular instance. Now from India, they all have instructions, please send pictures. Hmm? Imagine oh, getting blank silhouettes. So, um, he is talking about a conversation uh, we were having about something. You know, my uh, personal teacher, Maheshwar Nath Babaji, who sit with those matted hair type, um, he hated to be photographed. So when I met him, the first instruction he gave me was, he knew that my hobby was painting. So he said, don't paint my picture. I said, all right. But there was this innate desire that I should have a picture of him. So, you know, those days my mind still worked like, I was quite a rebel, like, ah, he may think so, but I'm going to take, somehow manage a photograph. Of him. The young intellectual thinker and so on coming especially from the leftist state of Kerala. 
So, <laughs> so I, uh, I don't know if any of you have gone to Rishikesh and these places. You have? Mm -hmm. There is a place called Lakshman Jula. It will be on. There is a bridge over the river. So if you go there, you will find lots of local photographers with cameras. You go there, they'll click and ask for money. They'll deliver it to you in the evening or immediately as you like. So I went to one of these young fellows and developed a nice friendship, which is like buying him a cup of tea and so on. There's a German bakery there, all looking the river. So I took him there and got him. And uh, I told him, look, I want you to do a job for me. What do you want? I was 22 years old. Hmm. I said, do you know the other side of the... In those days, that bridge was not there. The bridge in Rishikesh, the other one was there, Lakshman Chula. If you had to cross, you have to take a boat. Hmm. So I said, I will be in the evening sitting on the other side of the river where Shivananda ashrams, Swami Shivananda's kutir. So next to that, there's a, nobody comes there, it's on the banks of the river, but the boat jetty is close by. So I'll be there and there'll be somebody sitting with me, a man with matted hair and so on. I want you to do me, I'll give you money, don't worry about that. Later. Oh, you please come in one of the boats that comes this side around 6 o'clock, 5.36. When you see me sitting with this guy, don't directly come and start clicking. Oh, you click here and there as if you are looking at everything. And then you also direct the camera and take a picture. Huh? And then don't show that you know me and go off. I'll collect the picture later. Is that okay? So here, ex I was in my mind beginning to suspect that Babaji is beginning to understand everything that I do. Just beginning to suspect. So I was a little scared that he might say at five o'clock, today we are not going there. But he said, oh, kachalo, let's go. So I was relieved, so we went there. And we sat down and he was talking with the Keno Upanishad and it went on like this for some time. And I'm looking for the boats to come. There were many boats coming, but this fellow is not there. If boats come, people get up, get off, go on to the jetty. I'm thinking, where is this guy gone? And then it turned 6 o'clock, 6.15, it's dark. I said, now if this guy comes, there's no point. The light is almost failing. And I was feeling a little restless in my mind. When suddenly Babaji turned to me and said, Hey, that photographer of yours will not reach. <laughs> I said, Wo aega, abhi nahi I said, So, then I got worried. I said, I've done a big mistake and so on. So I said, Babaji, please pardon me. I'll never do anything like this. I'm sorry. Hai, koi baat nahi, he said. And then he gave me a short lecture on what is photography. How is a photograph? In those days, all film, no digital, mind you. So he said, the light falls on the object, it reflects into the lens, the lens captures it and it comes in the film. This is how photographs are done. He said, yes, basic knowledge. Then he said, what if I have the capacity to not allow the light that falls on me to reflect back into the lens. Will you get me on the camera? I said, this is impossible. <laughs> I said, this is impossible. Then for a split second, instead of him, I only saw a black silhouette, like a cardboard, cardboard cutout for a flash. And that's it. Then Babaji said, Dekh liya. So I said, ah, dekh. So then I stopped all the tricks. I decided that this is not working here. So, um, I began to change. Till then I was kind of this way, that way. So anyway, now this funny thing is that the next day I go back to Lakshman Jula. 
and the guy is there. <laughs> and he is very angry with me. He says, don't ask me to do such things to holy men. I said, what, what happened? I didn't. He said, you know what happened? I have been coming for four years here to Lakshman Juland. Never once it has happened. So morning session, then I go back to Dehradun and then I come back for the evening, afternoon, because my mother is there alone. So, never it has happened this time. I said, okay, I must hurry up a little early. So I got into a bus and the axle broke. Something broke, the bus is not moving. I got into an ambassador car where already there were seven people. So we became eight, nine, uh, picked up on the way. H halfway through as we about to enter the Kailas Ashram, tack, axle broke. <laughs> so I said, now this is something inauspicious. <laughs> so I went back home, my mother was waiting for me. So I went, this is what happened, so from now on, please, don't ask me to do such stupid things. I said, look, I had good intentions. Babaji doesn't want a photograph, but since you feel bad and you feel that he might, there might be a curse or something, huh? if you come in the evening, I will let him meet you. <laughs> so, I didn't ask him, him, I asked, told this guy. So, gingerly I told Babaji, in the evening, Sham ko wo aega photograph, this photographer will come in the evening. He said, why? He said, no, no, he's not taking, he wants to touch your feet. Ha, acha, I said. Hmm. So the fellow came and touched his feet. <laughs> and he was so frightened, he was keeping his camera. <laughs> so these things can happen. So. Hmm. Namaste, hmm. sir. Um, I, I had a question. Um, you spoke about the eye of the eye and the observer looking at the mind. The mind may perceive, the, the observer may perceive the mind as, <laughs> as a part of itself. But can the mind perceive the observer? No. The mind can look. But because it cannot perceive, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You see, the capacity to perceive which the mind has is because of this. Let me put it this way. I know that there are, there are people sitting here because I can see you all, right? Who is seeing it? Through what am I seeing? My eye? Because my eyes are seeing it, I know that my eye exists. I cannot see my own eye. I'm just giving you an example. I can see a reflection of my eye, of course, in the mirror, but that's a reflection. I cannot reverse and look at my eye, right? But I know that I exist because if it doesn't exist, I won't see any of you. It's similar to that. Uh, the process of Kriya is to make the energies in the body travel in such a way that everything becomes quiet and calm and the mind stops all mischief and is resting. When that happens, then there is only the other. <laughs> My question is from the crazy book again. Um, and it might Do you want me to disappear? No. <laughs> <laughs> and it might sound silly, but there is an incident where uh, the Nagas come and insert strobes in your brain and your senses of perception and your ability to perceive accelerates mm -hmm. tenfold. Mm -hmm. So, so if that technology is available, it's not or is av was available to you? <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> not only it, it's not that it's not available, but it's not a good thing to accelerate like that, except for a special purpose. It's, it's always good to move slowly and go into it, rather than... Uh, because till then I was normal like you. And then I have become a nut now. You see this? So I, I, sometimes it goes off, even beyond my control, but I kind of rein it in and I can't, these are dangerous things to do, but it was done under supervision for a particular purpose, otherwise I would not have been able to sit and discuss these matters and make you understand anything. So it was for a special purpose. If I find 
that anybody is ready to become a nut, I will certainly do this. <laughs> Technology is available. <laughs> To what extent Kriya can actually make yeah, these? Now, now. That was my real question. Yes, yes. So Kriya is a process which happens slowly, gradually, but it can bring about the same result in a certain length of time. That's, that's the best way to go about it. It's almost like somebody saying, I can meditate nicely, so if I smoke cannabis, it will become better. You go crazy afterwards. You don't know what to do. <laughs> over. Last question, over. How many birds? <laughs> now that is a s serious question. <laughs> so, well, it has taken me many lives, but uh, so this is why I'm saying so don't get uh, discouraged. Keep going. Who knows? Your past birds may be better than mine. We don't know. Only when you touch there, you'll realize. Who knows? So don't put that as an excuse and say, no, no, there are so many lives, who's going to work? Maybe in one life it's possible. Look, I went through all that as a lesson so that I can teach you to avoid it as much as possible. As much as possible. You don't have to put your finger into the fire. You've seen me do it. It burns. Everybody doesn't have to do the same thing, right? So I've done it. So <laughs> I've been baked, roasted, kept on the anvil and beaten into shape. All these things have happened. So actually you, you guys are fortunate. You don't have to go through all this. Simple ways of doing it. Okay? So, on that note, we'll stop. Mm -hmm. In the next session, maybe if you have a question. And uh, in the next session, I'm kind of going to begin working on the relationship of all that we discussed with Kriya or any other sadhana. Okay. <coughs>